Well, folks, uh, just a handful of you, but it's it's uh, glad you could make it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, it's all it's all, all about quality, not quantity. You know, so uh, six of you is just fine. Six, exactly. Yeah, and and people may wander in too, so you never know. My name's Ron Rosenstock. Uh, you probably know that it was in the uh, the catalog about this uh, program I'm going to put on. You know about uh, you know just basically making better travel photographs. I'm sure all of you have traveled, and um, and I'm also sure you took a camera with you. Now, you know, um, there's lots lots to consider, you know, in travel photography, and um, there's there's no wrong way of doing it. Number one, a lot depends on what are you going to do with those photographs. You know, do you want to make a, a, a slideshow to show to your friends? You know, remember the old slide projectors? Well, now it's, you know, PowerPoint and, and this kind of, um, you know, digital imagery. Uh, but before that, and I used to do it also with the slide projector, you know, to show people what you experienced on your travels. Um, or some people will, like, make a, a blurb book. Uh, I know many people who, like, make a calendar every year and give it as Christmas gifts to their friends. You know, be, with Shutterfly and Blurb and all these companies now, it's very easy, you know, to do that. And then there, there are people where photography is just more important to them as their particular creative medium, and they would, you know, exhibit their work, you know, and there's just many, um, you know, galleries for and non-for-profit galleries that are always looking for good quality work. In fact, I do a workshop uh, in a lot of different um, sort of venues, you know, like I do it at the, the, the uh, in Concord, Mass, Concord Center for Visual Arts, and I've done it at the, the Vermont Photographic Center in, in Brattleboro. Um, I, I could name probably half a dozen other places where I do this uh, sort of half-day workshop called Getting Ready to Exhibit, and I teach people how to cut mats and to do framing. You know, it's, it's, when you know how, it's very simple, and when you do it yourself, save a ton of money. If you've ever taken any of your artwork to a, a custom framer, you know, it could be three, four hundred dollars for the mat and the frame. Well, that could buy you the mat cutter and everything else you need, and you could cut a zillion mats, you know. So, again, it depends on your, your, your level of, 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 of what you really intend to do, you know, with your travel photography. So I was talking to Larry earlier here, you know, about my life, and I got started uh, in photography back in the early 60s, well, no, middle 60s, when Minor White first came to MIT, uh, about 66, and um, I was really interested in photography, and he was the first teacher to come to my area. I was living in Cambridge at the time. And uh, so I studied with him, and. My life has just been in photography ever since. Uh, mostly large format, black and white, and that's what I've exhibited. I have work in you know, major museums uh, around the country and, and some in Europe. Uh, um, uh, in, actually, in Ireland, I have some work. In Iceland, I had a show uh, not too long ago at the National Museum of Iceland. So uh, it's just been my life. And um, I got into color because of digital photography. Before that, just black and white, large format. Well, <clears throat> make a long story short, when digital photography first came out, obviously, the, you know, unless you have the camera set for monochrome, it's gonna be in color. And uh, a lot of work just seemed to work better in color. And this was about 25 years ago. And at that time, my mother uh, was in an assisted living place in, in Worcester, Mass. And, um, I had this idea of doing a little travelogue for her and, and the other patients living there, and I really enjoyed doing it. So one thing led to another, and now I do these sort of programs at many uh, you know, assisted living and uh, retirement places and senior centers all, all around New England, and I just sort of enjoy doing it. So I put together a program, I'm calling it Traveling With Your Camera. You know, basically, I'm going to show you a lot of the work that I do. Now you may wonder why I have work in so many different countries. I started a company called the Irish Photographic Workshop in 1971. I was the first person to organize a, a photographic workshop in a foreign country, which is Ireland. And um, I've been working in Ireland for many, many, many years. 
Uh, back in 1985, I was made an honorary citizen of the town of Westport in County Mayo, because that was my home base. And I've just brought so many people there over the years. And I still go back to Ireland. It's kind of my home away from home. Um, but it was probably, uh, and, and so I did that from the 70s right through to the early 80s when I got a, um, a letter in the mail. This is just before email, so a regular letter from another company that said, we've seen your ad about Ireland. You know, for many years, would you be interested in taking a group to Kenya? I said, wow. I mean, going to Ireland was nothing. That's like driving to New York somehow. In fact, it was easier to fly to, to, to Shannon than it is to drive to New York. So this seemed like, wow, this is a, a, a real adventure to go to Kenya. So I did that for a few years. Anyhow, the company I worked for back then, they were so much more organized than I was. And, um, uh, oh yeah, what happened was the New York Times heard about me somehow and did a, a, like a, 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 like a, like a three-page story in the travel section of the Sunday Times you know, about me leading these photo tours, because this was really early on. Nobody was doing it. I actually started the whole industry, and since then it's, it's blossomed, it's, it's exploded, just like this microphone almost did here. So, um, <clears throat> now, uh, I, I know I want to show you the pictures, but I get excited telling you about how I got into this. So, uh, I, I, I kind of turned over my Irish business to this other company, and then they had me doing all these other countries. Now, for instance, since April, I've been working in New Zealand, Scotland, and Morocco. And I think there's another country I was in there, too. I can't even remember. I do a lot of traveling, obviously. And um, I'm slowing down. Uh, I, I, I passed my 80th birthday. So I, I told my wife, no more winter trips, just spring and fall. So that's what I'm going to be doing. And coming up uh, in the next year, I have Iceland and Greenland, Ireland, Morocco, Italy, Faroe Islands, and I think one other country, can't even remember now. Too many on my list. And I'm the worst businessman possible. I was gonna bring in some brochures and stuff, but I, I forgot. Uh, but if you're interested in, in doing a photo tour, which is not like a Globus bus tour. The, the, this is a, 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 a tour where, number one, you have to kind of have a, an interest in photography or, or just enjoy really exploring a country in depth. Because we go to a location and often say, okay, we'll be back at the bus in an hour and a half. And it's not a, a bus bus, it's more like a, um, a Mercedes Sprinter, you know, like a 14-seater bus. I, I average eight people, but I ma the maximum number I take is 12. But we ha we, I like a bigger vehicle because we carry lots of gear. And, and it's totally safe to leave stuff, you know, in, in the vehicle behind us. Some countries require more physicality, you know, like, um, uh, let me think, like, well, New Zealand, beautiful country, but to get to the places, there's lots of trails, lots of walking, lots of hiking. Uh, the opposite, that's also a beautiful country, where there's almost no walking. In fact, I've had people on crutches do this other country, Greenland. We stay in a four-star hotel, we're picked up uh, uh, by, you know, we go by taxi to the boat, which is two minutes away. Some of us walk, which is 10 minutes. And then we do these boat trips up these different fjords. So I better get started because it actually starts uh, with the Greenland trip. And here we are. This is, Nuuk is the capital of Greenland on the west coast. I, used to, I started doing the east coast of Greenland some years ago, but it was a little bit too rugged. No, it was much, like the place we stayed in was more like a youth hostel than a hotel. And the boat we stayed in, used to use, you know, was open in the back, we froze to death. It wasn't for people my age <laughs> at all. It was for much younger people. I switched now to the exact opposite. My trip to Nuuk now, we stay in a hotel where all the diplomats and all the, you know, the people in government stay. It's the best hotel in all of Nuuk. They have like three gourmet restaurants in the hotel. Like it's a really super duper hotel. And we go out, um, um, we do a few trips by boat and a few trips by bus. The bus trips are often in the evening, like from 11.30 to one, when we go to photograph Northern Lights. You know, there's a lot of places um, where we could get the beautiful Aurora Borealis. 
Wow, I'm talking too much in my hands. I almost knocked this over again. You know, um, and then during the day, we go up the, the, the fjords. You see, like, Nuke is over here. And we go in these boat trips up these protected fjords where all these icebergs are floating down. So we get sort of up close and personal, you know, to these huge ice flows. And they're icebergs is, is kind of like sculpture. It's like nature's sculpture. And I'm going to show you a few. Here's, you know, one it's a shooting into the sun. Um, <clears throat> you know, this, you're going to see some photographs that are more like holiday pictures, like, you know, here I am in front of the Taj Mahal, here I am in front of the pyramids. You know, that's kind of, yeah, better if you can lower the light, it, 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 it'll be brighter. Um, well, I don't know how to work the lights. Oh, Lou, could you lower the lights a little bit more? Yeah, okay, okay. You might as well go all the way. What the heck? It's not, the, <laughs> we're not, it's not like a movie theater. We're in the dark, you know, dropping popcorn. So, um, how do you take the light with the sun coming in? How do you take the picture with the sun coming in? <laughs> I, um, I, you know, sometimes you get flair, sometimes you don't. And... With digital photography now, I figured there's always going to be minimal flare, and I have a choice of leaving it or cloning it out. Again, if you want to make better images, you have to know something about the software. If you don't, I mean, I got started with digital by taking my CF card to, to CVS, because I didn't know anything about software. I'm, I'm a darkroom guy. Like, I, I, I learned from Ansel Adams and, you know, people like that. So um, digital was like, it's a new language. It's a whole different thing. So I, I, I went to CVS, and I could see, I, well, at CVS in the machine, you could lighten it, you could darken it, you could crop it, but you couldn't do anything else. So I went to the Apple store, and um, <clears throat> they had a um, program called One on One. This is when, when I think Aperture first came out for uh, Apple computers, you know, for Macs. And uh, for, I think it was $100 for a year. I could go like once a week and get a private lesson, and I would, I would have questions, and they would show me how to do it. I only went twice. Once I got started, it, it became intuitive. I, I wasn't afraid to try things because I knew I couldn't mess up. I could always go back one, you know, to, to make up for anything that I didn't like. You know, so I, I learned that way. You, you learn by having questions. So I could clone out, you know, a lot of the flair. So I, I do often photograph looking into the sun, and, and at a smaller aperture, you get the starburst effect also. You know, a lot so of cameras... The way you control that is with your aperture and your shutter speed? Yes. So now, this is my boat, so I have to have, uh, you know, a fairly high, higher, maybe 800 ISO, something like that. So if I'm shooting like an F-22, you know, I'm going to get the starburst. But I'd probably be like 125th of a second or 250th of a second, and that's fine. That'll do the trick, you know. So um, and you know that that kind of um, you know iceberg blue color is kind of pretty dramatic, you know. So just photographing you know various shapes of these huge icebergs floating by is always kind of exciting, and. To make it more interesting as a travelogue, I put somebody in the picture. I mean, this is obviously nothing I'm going to be exhibiting, but just to kind of show you, you know, what, what, what we're doing here. So, as I said, the Iceland, I mean, the Greenland trip, um, I once had someone in a scooter, in fact. He had to be helped, you know, just to get into the scooter and out. But there's no walking involved. Like, anybody could do the Greenland, uh, the, uh, yeah, the Greenland trip. And the boat is, uh, it, it's, uh, it could take like up to, I think, um, 15 or 16 people inside. Again, we only take 12 and we hire the whole boat. So we don't have, you know, other people joining us. And uh, it's a heated interior. And, uh, you know, I go in uh, September uh, when we do get the northern lights. And it's never that cold, believe it or not, in the west coast of Greenland. Not, never that cold. Honestly, some people, um, a lot of people are showing up with iPhones now. E even people 
who are really experienced, good photographers. There's so much you could do with the new iPhones. Honestly, that technology is beyond me. I'm still, well, I was telling Larry, I just switched to, to a, a mirrorless, you know, just to lighten my load. Um, you know, I've been traveling with a regular, you know, 35 millimeter. I had a Canon Mark III and a Canon Mark IV. I had those two cameras with me, you know, for many years. And I just sold them all and went to uh, the, the Canon uh, mirrorless that's half the weight and half the size. And, you know, the, there's a lot I could tell you about the cameras. Uh, but uh, briefly, the R, you know, this R series is called like R6, R7, R8. The R, I have the R8, which is like half the price of the R5 and the R6. Little smaller battery. It's like uh, 24 point something megapixels and it's a full frame sensor. So you're getting really, really good quality. The same kind of quality I'd get with my, my Mark III. But it's half the weight. And it was like, I think I got it on Amazon for $1,400. We're, we're double the price for the R5 and R6. Okay, some Aurora Borealis right in the town of Nuke. Now, they often say you have to have total darkness. Well, look at all the street lights and all there. It's just so bright in the west of Greenland. And it's interesting, um, I got better photographs in the west of Greenland than the east coast of Greenland, and it has to do with where the you know, cloud formations, and because of where the mountains are, there are far more clouds and, uh, I mean, you know, and mountains in the east coast that kind of block the, the aurora, where in the west coast here, it just has to do with the relationship to the ocean and the clouds and all that business, but you get more sunny days and more aurora borealis on the west coast of Greenland than on the east coast. Okay, on a tripod, um, and um, not a, a particularly high ISO. If you look closely, you see the stars are not moving. So it's not like two or three minutes, but it's on a tripod and I'm maybe about like F4, you know, pretty wide open. And, um, and I let the camera determine how long an exposure to make. I'm, I'm not setting it manually. I'm, I'm just hitting the button and, and I think it went for like 15 seconds or something like that. But it's easier just to set it on AV and let the camera decide. And then you could look at it, uh, you know, and if it's too light or too dark, you make an adjustment on, on the exposure slider. And, you know, that's the beauty of digital. You could look at the image right away and then you could, you know, make, make it, take in more light or less light to get the exposure that you want. Okay, moving right along. I know this is not the best map. Uh, it was one of those obviously folding maps. This is South Island, New Zealand, which is a fabulous destination for the most beautiful nature you could possibly imagine, especially uh, the lakes and, and, and mountains. Okay, our first stop was Mirror Lakes. Mirror Lakes is down in the south near Milford Sound. Have any of you been to South Island, New Zealand? So you know how, how, how gorgeous it, it, it can be there. So I just have, I've made many images. I'm just gonna show you some of my favorites, uh, you know, from Mirror Lakes, because there's so many countries I wanna cover, you know, in, in, the, in the next like 40 minutes. So it's obviously called Mirror Lakes for a reason. You know, the lake is always very still, you know, so it really uh, gives you a fabulous reflection. Here's just looking in another direction earlier in the morning when the mist is rising you know, off the lake. Um, and then it's fun for travel photographs, you know, to put the name of the place in it. This was the group I had. As you see, there were two, four, just six people. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're all pretty serious photographers. Well, no, he was a birder, not a photographer. <laughs> Big difference, but he enjoyed the birds. We all enjoyed the birds and we learned a lot because of him. But even, you know, birders enjoy these, these trips as well. So this is at Lake Matheson. Um, I think these are birds up there. It looks like spots but, uh, or dust on my sensor. But it's, I could have cloned them out, but it's, it's actually birds. You know, and, this is, uh, and that's, uh, I guess, Mount Matheson in the back. That's, uh, that's Smiling Me. And this, this is uh, the lake. Again, just beautiful reflections. And you know, um, it's interesting, you know, uh, some people, uh, 
you know, tried to create because, uh, images based on rules that they've read, you know, like the rule of thirds. Well, I have a new rule called Rosenstock's rule of halves. You know, <clears throat> as Ansel Adams said, you could apply the rules if you want to, but only after the fact. Because you can't, you can't say, <clears throat> you, you can't make up rules for, for art. <clears throat> I mean, it's the way you see things. Like um, some of my black and white work, I have a lovely image of the Taj Mahal <clears throat> totally cut in half from the, from the far side of the river in the Taj Mahal, the total reflection in the foreground. It's a black and white image. And this whole show is color, so I, I didn't bring that. And I don't go to India anymore. Uh, I did India a few times. Tough, tough country. Okay, a little bit more around Lake Matheson. And, and then about birds. This is a Kia. And these birds will like fly by your feet and pull at your shoelaces. They'll, they'll land on your windshield and peck on your wipers. They're the cheekiest birds you could possibly imagine, and they have no fear. And this was not done. This was done with a wide-angle lens, not a telephoto. I was maybe two feet from the bird. He was walking on the top of a van. You see the shadow, light shadow there? This is of a white van. And I just went up to him and uh, took his picture. I, I think he was looking for bugs on the top of the, the van there. But, I mean, these birds in, in New Zealand are just amazing. Then sometimes for travel photographs, just think out of the box, you know. <laughs> Do something a little, a little different every now and then. So here we are at dinner, and uh, <clears throat> I shot, a, you know, I took a photograph of, of this person on my trip through my wine glass. Why not? Add, add a little humor to a, to a show. And then sometimes you just can't resist photographing a good meal. And this, this is my idea of a hearty breakfast, you know, in, in New Zealand, which is similar to England or Ireland or Scotland, you know, bacon, egg, sausage, the whole nine yards. Really good stuff. That's fun to do that. And then group photos, I, I think, are kind of a nice thing to put into a travelogue. Again, I was still in New Zealand, and, and, I, and I left this here to show you that it's really good to take advantage of certain things that are kind of weather dependent, even though maybe a little bit more expensive. The last time I was, in, well, the time before the last time I was in New Zealand, their currency was much stronger than it is now. So I was just there in April, and um, I remember a couple of years ago when I was there, the flight was something like $700. This time it was, I think, 275 So we all did it. And, and we fly over Mount Cook and braided rivers, you know, and it's really a very, very exciting experience. And I just put one photograph in here of a braided river. Um, you shot that through the window? Yes. Yeah, yeah. In, in, a, in those airplanes, they keep the windows clean. They tell you, don't put your lens against the window because you could scratch it. You know, so you just kind of be very careful. And, and what, they, what the plane would do, they, they would circle around some interesting area one way and tilt the plane a little bit, then they'd go back and do it the other way. So on both sides, and there was a small airplane, as you saw. I, I, I think there was like maybe seven seats on each side. So it was, it was pretty, pretty small. Another thing we, we did this time was a helicopter ride. Uh, we went to the top of the Fox Glacier, and that was also relatively inexpensive and... Uh, I think it was one of the highlights of the trip. It's like just a you know, 10 minute ride up to the top and we landed on this glacier and then we got out of the helicopter, it was like a snowpack. So we could get out of the helicopter and walk around and photograph. And it was, it was like being on the top of Everest without any effort. <laughs> you know? It was really pretty uh, amazing. And, and this is one of my images. And the sun was kind of behind the clouds so it was very diffused. And these are the different peaks you know, from the Fox Glacier down in South Island. It was just a very, very exciting experience. You know, here's some more from, from the same uh, experience on Fox Island, Fox uh, Glacier. Or, um, this, was, this was in April. This was in April. But it is this way year round. But I, uh, in the winter, it, it can be much, well, their winter is our summer. It's the other way around. So from April, you go May, June, July, August. So this was like our fall, uh, October, even though it was, it was there April. And it is 
it, it, it's a long flight. I think it's like 12 hours from LAX or, um, uh, or, or uh, San Francisco. Um, but they now have direct flights actually from, believe it or not, from Chicago and also Houston. Coming home, I flew through Houston. I think it was 14 hours from Auckland to Houston. And then, you know, Houston to Boston, hop, skip, and a jump. So <laughs> you look like you have a question. No, <laughs> I, thought, I saw it. So, anyhow, uh, Fox Glacier was just super exciting to be there. And the, the company had two helicopters. I was photographed the other helicopter just as their group was getting in to, uh, to take off. <clears throat> so it was really one of the highlights of the trip. Uh, we also visit uh, a sheep farm. I'm sure many of you have been to sheep stations, you know, and to see uh, the sheep shearing and Anyhow, believe it or not, all those sheep are being driven by one dog. And, and, the, and the, the man who is the, the owner of this sheep station, he talked so softly, I had trouble hearing him. <laughs> I was amazed at what this dog could do. It was mind-blowing. <clears throat> so here I, uh, you know, the dog actually brought some sheep close to us so we could photograph close up. And then, of course, there is the, the shearing demonstration. You know, and that, that takes about probably a good 10 minutes per sheep. And uh, you've got to be strong to, to keep the sheep in that position. You know, um, and also, as, as you know, photographing it, trying to really zero in on what's happening without too much extraneous uh, stuff going on. And this is, believe it or not, the fleece from that one sheep I couldn't get over the size of it. You know, the way they, they have this system of doing the shearing where it comes off in one huge piece. And that is one fleece from that one sheep. And then sometimes photographs are good to give you scale. That's me, little me down there. And uh, someone sent me that photograph from the, from the trip just to give you an idea of just the, the incredible scale of things in, in New Zealand, the mountains. You know, another thing, that they're really into ecology. They have these fabulous trails, and you go on boardwalks. And not the type of boardwalk where you're going to fall through rotten wood, either. I mean, they're all really maintained boardwalks. Uh, there was one place called the Devil's Falls. We had to go up. It was like on the side of a mountain. But it was, it was steps. You'd have about 10 steps this way, and then a little landing, and a bench to rest, and then 10 more steps, as opposed to trampling you know, the vegetation or going through wet areas and all that. Like regular staircase that they built. They really do an excellent job on their trail system. OK, moving on to Iceland. Now, it's interesting. This is my guide. Stefan Valsun is his name. And I've been working with Stefan a little over 20 years, you know, at least once a year. And uh, I saw him not too long ago on PBS because Rick Steves works with him also. So you all know the Rick Steves travel show. He also works with Stefan. And um, actually, I got started with Stefan when he actually worked for another company. But now he does, he has his own uh, tour company. He has, I think, three Mercedes Sprinters and some smaller vehicles. He has people working for him. He's really expanded. And he's doing exceptionally well. And you know, he meets us at the airport and spends time with us. Um, his English is perfect. When he was in high school, he was one of those exchange students. He spent a year, believe it or not, in Wyoming, living with, with a family in Wyoming. And uh, his English is, you, you wouldn't know that he's Icelandic. His English is so good. <clears throat> So we always get to the right place at the right time. Um, this is Skogafoss, one of the most famous and touristy waterfalls uh, in Iceland on the south coast. But if we get there about 4 in the afternoon, we always get a double rainbow. Every time I've been there, we've had this incredible double rainbow. And it's, 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 the background is very dark because it's all lava. You know, I mean, Iceland is basically all lava, all, all volcanic. Like right now, for instance, just uh, not too far from the airport in a town called Grindavik, you may have seen in the news, they had to evacuate the whole town because the streets, like the fissures opened up and, and, and it's steaming. It's not like flowing lava yet. It could calm down or it could get worse. Hopefully it'll just calm down. And they, uh, they closed another area. You, uh, some of you, if you've been to Iceland, you know the Blue Lagoon. 
And they've had to close that because that's close enough to Grindavik where it could be in danger. So they're just waiting until things calm down. <clears throat> so this is the same waterfall, uh, Skogafoss, uh, from a little bit of a distance away, so I have some sky in it and the rainbows. The rainbows are obviously from the, the mist, you know. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, if you are dressed for it, you can get much closer, of course, you know, but it is pretty wet. You know, and this is the first time I've seen kind of a, 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 a round rainbow <laughs> like that. This is one of the, uh, the glaciers that we go to, you know, also on, on South Island. And the neat thing about Iceland is it's not a lot of hiking. Like, there would be much more hiking in, in New Zealand. In Iceland, the parking lots are kind of right near these places. Like, this is very, very close to where we park our vehicle. You know, there's not a lot of hiking required uh, in Iceland. Some of the, you'll see pretty soon a place called Jogelsarland, the ice lagoon, um, and the parking lot is like right there, <laughs> right next to this lagoon. You step out of your bus and you can start photographing. It's like right, right close by. Um, it's really pr pretty amazing. Uh, this is, if I remember correctly, it's called Svinefellsjoku. And uh, in, in English, that means the pig glacier. And I asked why, and no one seems to know. <laughs> so, You've been going for how long? Uh, at least 20 years. Oh my gosh, yes. Yes, 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 to the seventh power, yes. E even more so in Greenland, because uh, we go to the moraine of some of the glaciers. Um, I mean, so these glaciers are receding 60, 70, 80 yards every time I go. It's, it's further back. No, northern climates, the, the ice is going back. Everything you see on these PBS specials about climate change, it's all true. You know, it's all true. And I, I often tell people that Iceland is a land of waterfalls and rainbows. We get a lot of rainbows because you get a lot of showers and then it clears away and the sky is bright blue, but then there's this wonderful rainbow. And this is a reflection, actually, of a glacier, uh, the, the moraine of a glacier, the edge here. And this is at, at that ice lagoon I mentioned called Jogel Sarlan. Uh, and uh, it's a very popular place, but the neat thing about it is like no one could be in front of you. It's like the, the, the lagoon is there. No one's going to be in the water, so <laughs> you kind of line up and you could, you could photograph there. And there's also a little coffee shop there as well. And there's just so much to see. Um, this is walking maybe five minutes down the lagoon, and, and it was a very calm day, and I saw these, this incredible reflection. And here's people working just across the road from Yoga Sarlan called Diamond Beach. Um, and this is sort of my group here. It's called Diamond Beach because the ice from uh, the main glacier floats past the parking lot and in a river that goes uh, uh, under, the, uh, uh, there's a bridge, so it goes across the road and then goes out to the ocean. So you have all these huge chunks of ice going out to sea, and then the tide washes all that ice up on this lava beach, this black beach, and this tide goes out and the ice is stranded. So it, it looks like all these diamonds on the beach, so they call it Diamond Beach. Really uh, an amazing experience to be amongst all these, these chunks of ice. Then in uh, downtown Reykjavik, this uh, beautiful sculpture, this is all stainless steel. Um, tourists call it the Viking ship. Uh, the artist who made it, the sculptor, calls it the Sun Voyager. And um, it's, it's a place we always stop. And I photographed this sculpture in all kinds of weather, sometimes black and white, sometimes color. Here with the sun out, I just caught a little bit of the sun hitting the top of this. And it's obviously patterned after an ancient Viking ship. It's one of the, you know, the monuments in, uh, in Reykjavik. Reykjavik, by the way, the name means Smoky Bay. When the Vikings first came, you know, and, and they, they saw all the smoke rising from these fissures, um, they called it Reykjavik because Vik, V-I-K, means bay. And so, uh, so Reykjavik means Smoky Bay. That's why they call it that today. 
And then, of course, the Icelandic ponies. We always stop to photograph the ponies. So here I photograph one of my group members photographing these ponies. These are am amazing, um, oh, sorry, correction. They are not called ponies, they're Icelandic horses. But they're so small, being an American, I tend to call them ponies. But I've, I've, every time I say that in Iceland, I'm corrected. Uh, they're a rare, I mean, they're an unusual breed of horse. They have a fifth gait, it's, it's like walking fast, it's called the tolt. You hardly feel that you're on the horse and they're really moving. They don't canter, they don't gallop, they just walk fast. And uh, they, so horseback riding is uh, a, a major tourist uh, attraction in Iceland. Um, many Icelanders own a few horses, especially those who live you know, outside of the big cities. They, they really enjoy their horses. And th they export horses. Uh, there's one farm in California that takes about 200 of these horses a year. These horses are great with children. They're small and they're very mild-mannered. I mean, I've seen, like, in a pasture, 30 or 40 of these horses together. I've never seen any two horses fighting with each other. In America, that just doesn't happen. You know, the breeds we have here, you know, one always has to be the dominant, uh, you know, alpha male, and, they, you know, they, they fight for, uh, like, a certain pecking order. They don't seem to do that there in Iceland for some reason. So you can get really up close and personal. These horses are not waiting on the side of the road for a tourist bus to stop. They're out in the field. But as soon as we stop and we walk over to the fence, and it's all fenced in, they come over just because they're curious. They don't nibble on us because they're not used to being fed. You know, here in America, we often give uh, you know, apples or carrots or sugar or something. So the horses expect to get something when you go over to greet them. It's not that way at all. In Iceland, these horses come over out of pure curiosity. And um, it's just kind of fun to, to, to photograph them because I'm right at this barbed wire fence, you know, so I could easily you know, photograph these wonderful animals. The, yeah, yeah. This one we called Raquel. We kind of named her that. So there's some similarity, I guess. And the interesting thing is also churches. You know, in New England, a church, um, you, you know, would, would be in the middle of the town square and the town is around it. Well, the, the population of Iceland is just so dispersed that they built their churches in just beautiful, inspiring places. And this is on a hillside above the village of Vik. It's just V-I-K, meaning bay, again, on the south shore. And... Um, it's just, that's a mountain in back of it with this little red roof church. And uh, it's interesting, the government keeps these churches open. People pay taxes to keep the churches open, although almost nobody goes to Sunday Mass. But <laughs> they want to be, you know, when they, they die, they want to have a church service, and they often want to go, uh, you know, um, Christmas Eve, you know, to a service also. But in terms of regular church goers, Icelanders are not. Um, you know, it's probably 90% Lutheran, um, you know, uh, but they're, they're not what you call religious people, but they're all willing to pay a portion of their taxes to keep these churches going, because that's part of their culture. Ron, what was the color of the, of the land there? What was the color? The, the actual, this, this, you know, it's interesting. The difference, it's more like my computer. This was in the springtime, uh, before it turned green. It's more brown. Uh, for some reason, the projector here yeah. is making everything a little on the yellow side. You know, basically, I would, if, I, if it were my projector, I'd go into the menu and <laughs> take out some of the yellow. But it's, it's not that critical. But, you, but it's very, very, you can see there's a huge difference. You all saw my computer, how it's, it's much, much browner. This is more like it actually was. So that's one thing with projectors, you really have to f fiddle with them to get the right color balance. And you can't do that with everyone who comes here with a computer, because everyone's computer can be different also. So it is what it is. Okay, now, a little sidestep here <laughs> uh, to Cushing, Maine. Because um, I, I do um, a one-week workshop in Vinyl Haven, Maine, in the beginning of June. 
And um, it's more of a workshop where we actually go out photographing like in the morning and uh, work on our images later on and, uh, and you know, there's, there's critiques and I teach mat cutting and I even bring a printer with me so we can do some printing there. It's real, really a workshop. But on the way to Cushing, Maine, which I mean on the way to, to Vinyl Haven, um, which you got to get to by ferry from Rockland, um, I pass through Cushing and uh, I stopped uh, recently to photograph at uh, the Olson Farm. And this, uh, you, you all know this painting by Andrew Wyatt, you know, called Christina's World. And it's just a beautiful building. And this was my photograph of the building that I did this uh, last spring. Um, it's just on the way to, to Vinyl Haven, Maine, which is a beautiful, beautiful little island. Uh, has anyone been to Vinyl Haven or North Haven or any of those islands? It's all from, you get there by ferry, you know, from Rockland. And I've been going there for family vacations starting about 40 or 45 years ago when our kids were little. And uh, they're no longer little, but my wife and I still go uh, for a uh, family, just the two of us go. We go the end of July, beginning of August every year. And then I do this workshop the beginning of June. You know, it's only, it's a four hour drive from here to Rockland. So it's not like flying to Europe or anything, it's much, much easier. <clears throat> okay, now, um, this is my route in Morocco. And uh, I've been doing this also, I think, of almost 25 years, actually, in Morocco. There's Casablanca. From Casablanca, we often go down the coast to Essaouira, a coastal town, a fishing port. And then we go west towards Marrakesh. And then we go kind of south over the Atlas Mountains to Warzazats. And then we continue to Tamarir and to Erfoud and then down to Merzouga. That's the Sahara. That's where the dunes are. From the dunes, we go all the way up a long drive to Fez. I think, where's Fez? That's Fez. Yeah, yeah there's Fez. That's, that's a whole day drive. And then we spend like three nights in Fez. Fez is like the intellectual, religious, spiritual center of Morocco. Um, and, and the Medina there has something like 15,000 little streets. When, and I was telling Larry that when we, when we take people through these little streets, we have a guide in front and a guide in back so nobody gets lost. There's so much to see. You can really go on overload. From Fez, we go up to Chef Chefchaouen on the top, the blue city. Um, it's, it's all blue, just fascinating ancient city. And we spend a, a day there. We often photograph early in the morning when, the, when there's nobody on the streets. And then the next day, it's a, a drive. We have lunch in Rabat, back to Casablanca, where we stay at the Hyatt Regency. And then we don't, we, we don't uh, skimp at all on that Morocco trip. It's all very deluxe. Is and then, that a one-week trip? Or no, no. That's a 10-day that's a trip. <clears throat> yeah, that's a 10-day trip. And then we fly home the next day. So I'll show you some images now, some of my friends in Morocco. You know, for, for photographing people, Moroccans, uh, you know, in a way, like you wouldn't go out to the Southwest and just randomly photograph Navajo. Or you wouldn't go to Kenya and randomly photograph the Maasai. You have to have a connection. You know, you have to know people, but once you know people, they're friendly, they're warm, they're inviting. And we take people to, people that I've known for years and years and years, this guy, uh, he's a very religious man. In fact, you see that white under, under his jalaba? He's wearing a, a white skull cap. That, that means he's called a haji, which means he's been to Mecca. So he's, he's kind of a, a special person. Um, and he owns a restaurant. And I've just known him because we've been stopping in the same restaurant for many, many, many years. And I, I have photographed him and I've brought him photographs. And uh, he's just a really, really lovely man. So someone took this picture one of my group members of, of me and this man. Um, and then there's the tea ceremony. If you've been to Morocco, you know, I, I don't know how in the world they do this. But he's looking at me. His eyes are looking at me. He's not looking where he's pouring. And he doesn't spill a drop. The glass is filled with fresh mint. So they have this kind of green tea that goes into fresh mint. Uh, they like it with a lot of sugar. We generally don't. So they know, they, before giving us tea, they always say, do you want sugar or not? You know, or a little bit, you know, then they make it to taste. But um, it's, I like a little bit of sugar in, in my mint tea. 
but how they pour, they say it aerates, it adds to the flavor when you pour it up so high. I don't recommend trying it, <laughs> but I think it's amazing to, to see it. You know, again, it's a totally different culture. <clears throat> Here's a, a street photographer, and we stop by and see him every time. He's in Marrakesh, and uh, you know, uh, he has a little tassel on his head that is kind of spinning around. This is some, um, just a tradition that they do, and, and he does this sort of chanting, and you know, he has a basket in front of him that we throw in some dirhams. Ten dirham is one dollar. So, um, you know, it's interesting, like in, in, the, in Marrakesh, in the big square in Marrakesh called Jamal Lufna, people go there to be photographed. They dress up, um, you know, in costumes, and they're snake charmers, and, and um, oh gosh, people with monkeys on their shoulders, and, and dancers, and, and fortune tellers, and all that. And, uh, and the tourists will give them, you know, ten dirham to take their picture. It's very touristy, but it's an experience. And eating in a Moroccan restaurant is an experience. They start off with salads before the main meal. Okay, there's like something like 18 little dishes. Yeah, I can see lentils and carrots and eggplant and the zucchini and, and um, uh, just, uh, it just looks like. I don't know, corn, cauliflower, all kinds of salad stuff. And you just sort of pass it around. You put a little bit on your plate and pass it to the next person. This is just a Moroccan tradition that we don't do in our country. Everything seems to be organized. You know, uh, the way they display their wares, I always find interesting. So here is a, a street, um, uh, uh, you know, out on the street uh, kind of market for spices. And... Um, those are the prices in dirhams. Like 30 dirhams is like $3 per kilo, I imagine. You know, anyhow, it's, it's just interesting how they organize all this stuff. Everything seems to be kind of organized. Even their fishing boats are organized. You know what I mean? It's really quite, quite remarkable to see how, how nicely things are kind of laid out in Morocco. Lots to photograph in Morocco. This is just an olive market. Um, but they have so many different varieties of olives. You know, you go into um, any hotel bar, say, to have a gin and tonic or a glass of wine or whatever, they always get a bowl of, of marinated olives in Morocco. Some, some could be spicy. Yes? Oh, when you take a picture of the shop, are you also giving him money? No. No. No, no. Um, that is candid stuff like that we don't have to pay for. Uh, when, I, when I show you the square and I show you uh, some of the portraits, you'll understand the, the, the big difference. So here, just zeroing in on some of these delicious olives. I was never a big fan of olives until I started going to Morocco. But they are so good that um, they, they become addicting. Um, OK, we're up now in, uh, in uh, Chef Shawan in the Blue City. And this is an ancient olive tree that I saw in one of the squares. And, um, you know, they just keep it going. Olive trees could be hundreds and hundreds of years old. It's really amazing how, how long these trees could, could, could last. Because uh, I, I also take groups to, uh, you know, to Tuscany and uh, some of the olive trees there. They just keep on trimming them back and they just keep on growing from, you know, generation to generation to generation. It's just really amazing. So we get up early in the morning before there's any people you know, and uh, you know, photograph the town of Chef Shawan, which is all blue. So it's just interesting architecture that you don't see any place else. And you know, the plants and the blue backgrounds, um, and and these wonderful doorways that they have in Morocco. Really, very, very picturesque. Okay, off to the rug shop. You can't go to Morocco without visiting a rug shop. Believe me, that's part of the culture. You don't even have to buy anything. And we explain to everybody. First of all, I mean, let's say in the future, some of you will go to Morocco with me. We tell everybody that the guy that I work with, who is exceptionally well known, in fact, he leads all the National Geographic tours. He was telling me that the National Geographic tours, they pay twice as much, and they get to see half as much as the tours I do. You know, that's because people buy the brand name National Geographic thinking it's going to be better or something, you know. But anyhow, we go to the rug shop, 
And the National Geographic people will spend thousands of dollars on rugs. And uh, the, the people who own the rug shop, they know that we're photographers. And if we don't buy anything, that's fine, because the next group may buy you know, $20,000 worth of carpets. In my groups, generally, someone's going to buy a small carpet for four to six hundred dollars for a small one. And these are all handmade, beautiful carpets. But they, you know, they, they, we can photograph these people, uh, and they do this wonderful demonstration how the rugs are made. So it's really a, a history lesson uh, about the history of, of rugs in Morocco, a cultural experience, getting to know the people. They speak English. Uh, actually, they speak many languages. It's really a, a, amazing how many languages these people speak. Um, that, that's called the chalaba, the, uh, the blue robe. And um, b by having it blue, you know he's a Tuareg. You can tell what tribe people come from by their clothing. So these are, he actually, Hashem is his name. He's the owner of the shop. And this is a, one of his uh, uh, nephews, Rashid. And um, I think this is Hashem's wife, who is one of the people who works there. And she makes tea for everybody. She's a sweetie. And uh, also, they demonstrate on a loom how they make the carpets. So we can photograph the people. We can photograph the looms. And we can enjoy homemade tea <laughs> the way they do it in Morocco. And these are just a little sampling. You know, they roll out all these carpets. Just, I mean, they, they, they spend like a half an hour or so showing us all the different carpets. And then they say, if anyone is interested, you know, we'll answer any questions. And again, someone always winds up buying one or two. Sometimes nobody buys anything. And that's OK, too, because they know that the, the, the man I work with, his name is Ismael. He will be back with another group um, because they're so nice to us there that he goes to this particular rug shop. There's many, many different rug shops. But by going to the same one over and over again, they know us, they treat us well. In fact, every time I go back, I bring photographs of the people who work there. I, I give them some images, and they, they make a big fuss over it. <laughs> this is a fun thing in Arabic. It's called bishnika. And what bishnika is, is dried thistle. It, it, I mean, it, it costs like about 10 cents a piece. I, I should have brought one with me. I forgot it. They use this toothpicks. That's what the Moroccans use as toothpicks, dried thistle. You break off one little piece, and it's, a, and it's a toothpick. So it's very hard to find toothpicks in a shop, because everybody, all the, the outdoor markets and stuff, they sell this stuff that they call bishnika, you know, which is just dried thistle. OK, moving on now, Scotland. I was in Scotland in uh, September. And uh, in fact, I think I tore a ligament doing some hill climbing. I forget my age and uh, often do more than I should be doing. So this is um, uh, Eileen Dunin Castle, just over the bridge from the Isle of Skye. And we try to get there, you know, just as uh, either the sun is setting or they put the lights on in the castle and it reflects in the bay. It's one of the most famous castles. And I'm taking this about 10 yards from where we park our bus. I mean, the parking lot is like literally, whoops, right there. You know, so it's really easy to, to photograph this incredible castle. Very, very moving. Then here I have some of my group members photographing some of the stones. There are three sites uh, in, um, in, uh, in South, uh, uh, in, uh, sorry, in Kalanish, it's called, uh, the Isle of, of uh, uh, Lewis. Um, you know, Harris and Lewis are the same island, but um, they had a dispute uh, in, in ancient times, and uh, so they, they had different names for the exact same island. You know, um, uh, Lewis is on the top and Harris is on the bottom. Lewis is maybe two-thirds the size of the island, and on the island of Lewis are the stones of Kalanish. These are ancient stones, you know, you know built probably before Stonehenge. Nobody really knows... Uh, you know, they're like astronom astrological calendars and telling you like when to plant and when not to, you know, when to harvest and all that stuff. So there's just you know, these ancient, ancient stones that are really amazing to photograph. And here's an image I made of just one of the sites. There's the main site of the stones of Kalanish. Then there are two other sites nearby on, on, a, on adjoining hillsides that are really also pretty amazing. 
And then you got to do a group shot. You know, uh, for, for travel photos, it's fun to take a photo of the group that you're with. Um, here, I, again, this was one of the smaller groups. There's only five people, but we'll go with five. Um, you know, we're not really doing this. We, 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 I'm in this business because I love doing it. If I could just break even on a trip, and so will the owner of the company, we will do it as opposed to disappointing people. A lot of other companies, unless they have a busload of people, I can make X amount of dollars, they'll cancel the trip. We very, very rarely cancel a trip. And as the sun goes down, and the stones of Kalanish, this is the main center. Um, there was, I forget the name of the TV show where this guy touches that center stone, then he's transported back in time, uh, you know, to the, to the few hundred years. It was, it was a t Outlander, Highlander, something like that. Anyone know what I'm talking about? No. <laughs> okay. Never mind. <laughs> okay, now in Scotland, the Harry Potter train. This is the actual train that they filmed that scene with Harry Potter uh, going over this trestle. So we just make a stop there. Okay, going on to another one of my favorite countries, Italy. The land of the best food and wine, I think, in the world. I'm a little prejudiced, uh, but I really, I, I love uh, the food and wine in Italy. When I, um, my, I took that photograph I, probably 25 years ago on my first trip uh, at a coffee shop in Florence, and it was, the, and I, uh, I, I, it was so decoratively done, I had to photograph it. And I, I said to the, uh, the owner of the shop, I said, this is the best cappuccino I think I've ever had. And he looked at me seriously and said, I know. <laughs> Self-confidence, you see, that's, that's the Italian way. And, and the, you know, the food is very good. And then there's, there's Venice. Um, you know, I've been going to Venice so often that I'm now the local guide in Venice. Like, I know the best restaurants and, and best photographic sites and all that. And it really brings down the price that we don't have to hire a local guide in Venice. So um, it's really amazing. Um, this is, uh, as you see, a, a gondola with roses. And there's a, um, a hotel across this little inlet that's reflecting in, this, in the water, you know, causing that. So I just you know, kind of put the roses in the highlight of the reflection there. This one I'm actually using as a Christmas card this year. <laughs> uh, it had that kind of Christmassy feeling about it. You know, three, the three wise trees. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is actually taken in the villa where we stay in Tuscany, just early in the morning. Um, and I think that's still the moon, in fact, that I photographed. That's right outside the door of the villa that we stay in. Villa Rosa, it's called. Every time we go there, I ask them if they could change the sign a little bit to call it Villa Rosenstock. Yeah. But they, they haven't done that yet. They keep it Villa Rosa. And then, of course, St. Mark's. You know, in Italy, it's very, very touristy. So for those really interested in photography, before breakfast, we go out. Uh, and photographed by streetlight. You know, with the tripod, well, actually now, a lot of people don't even need tripods, you know, because the, the, you can shoot at a high ISO and the iPhones make adjustments for the light. It's just really amazing. So even without a tripod, you could do this. Um, just photographing the, you know, the streetlights in front of, um, you know, St. Mark's, just a corner of, of St. Mark's Cathedral here in Venice. Well, no, again, if you look at my, <laughs> it's not. Yeah. It's, again, it's your, it's your <laughs> I'm blaming the projector here. It needs to be adjusted. The color is way off. And I, I have no control. Oh, you know, it's interesting. I don't know if you can see there's a monitor on the side here, and that's more accurate color. That, um, I, uh, I, I believe the cable company is recording this, and uh, this is part of their setup, I imagine. So it's, they're probably taking it right off my computer, so that is what you see in that corner is the way it is in my computer, which is a more accurate color. More, more reflections in that same little area. I often take people there because the gondolas, 
they, the, the, the gondoliers have a bit of a rest around four in the afternoon, and the sun is at the right place hitting that hotel to make those reflections. So I, I take people there you know, to photograph the wonderful reflections in that, that area. And then this is right outside the door of Villa Rosa, which means like the rose villa. It's, it's, uh, that's the color of it. Um, it's, it's rose colored. <clears throat> I, and this is from the Academia Bridge, again early in the morning, capturing the sunrise between the domes of the Maria della Salute Church, which is just uh, remarkable. This is one of the first, first color pictures I took with a little point and shoot camera that I knew nothing about. It was purely on automatic, and, and all the noise, uh, like it almost looks like uh, an impressionistic painting. Yeah, it looks like, more like a painting. This was done with like a two megapixel camera about the size of a, of, of a pack of Marlboro. I mean, it was, I knew, I, I was just sort of, I mean, during this trip, I had my large format camera, and I just saw a little digital camera in a shop in fact, I had just finished a trip in Austria, and it was in one of the camera shops I saw, uh, I think in Vienna, I, I, I saw this camera, like $200 or something like that, so I bought it, figured I should try it out. And I made this one exposure that I was very happy with. But it does look more painterly than photographic. It is not what you call a sharp photograph at all, uh, but it, it has a nice painterly quality to it. It does, it does, but I mean, that's not, I've always wanted my photographs to look more photographic. <laughs> so, uh, but I accept that one. Here in Venice in the cemetery, her name is Sonia, and uh, it's kind of like a Romeo and Juliet story um, where she had committed suicide. She, was, uh, she escaped the Russian Revolution. She was a, a princess, and, and her family escaped to Venice, and on, her, on the plaque it explains you know, how she died, uh, her, her parents wouldn't, she went to the marry a local Venetian, and the parents wouldn't have it, and they both wound up killing each other. So anyhow, I visit her every time I'm there. And that purple color is really pretty awful. Again, if you look at the, uh, the monitor up there, I don't know if you can see that, that's the c color. It was like more of a almost stainless steel color. This was also done by simple little point and shoot camera. Uh, walking over one of the bridges in Venice, and all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I saw these lights, these Murano you know, street lights, you know, kind of lined up with the Maria della Salute Church dome, and I made this exposure. Ah, this, I tell people, is the equivalent of an Italian near-death experience, the light at the end of the wine cellar. So this was taken, again, the color, I apologize, you know, this is, it was all kind of much warmer brown, not yellow at all. Um, this was taken in the old wine cellar of Vinamaggio, and Vinamaggio in Greve was the ancestral home of Mona Lisa's parents. And that's documented in, in Italy. And we do a tour of the old wine cellar, and we have lunch there. Uh, one of those lunches where there's like five different courses, and with each course there's another kind of wine that you have to drink. And, um, and I don't drive in Italy, so it's okay. <laughs> and then we visit um, these people that my, uh, the guide that I've been working with for many years knows. They have this uh, shop where they make uh, violins and cellos and violas, and they've been doing it for about three or four generations. So we get to visit these people, and they all speak perfect English, you know, and to, to see their workshop, and it's really fascinating to see, whoops, to see how these wonderful instruments are made. It's really, really a treat. Okay, moving right along. I see my hour is up. I, I hope no one objects to going about 10 minutes over. The Faroe Islands, okay? So a lot of people don't know anything about the Faroe Islands. That's why I, I put this little fa fact sheet in here. Faroe Islands, self-governing archipelago, archipelago part of the Kingdom of Denmark. It comprises 18 rocky volcanic islands between Iceland and Norway in the North Atlantic Ocean and connected by roads, road tunnels, ferries, causeways, and bridges. Hikers and bird watchers are drawn to the island's mountains, valleys, and grassy heathland and steep coastal cliffs for, that harbor thousands of seabirds. Anyhow, um, I've only done one trip to the Faroe Islands and I hope to go back 
this coming May. And uh, we, go, we fly into Torsham, we stay there, and it's really amazing their underground tunnel system. They, the tunnel system that goes from island to island is so extensive, they have roundabouts in the tunnels where you can go to this island or this island. Whoops, I keep on knocking this over. Um, so it's really, I've, I've never seen such engineering, uh, you know, of, of tunnels. Um, it's really pretty, pretty amazing. And some of the, you know, to get to the, the far islands, we have to go by ferry. But just within this area here, it's just amazing, the scenery. It's, it's, it's basically, you know, this kind of scenery that you see, just very dramatic. Now, the first two slides, I can't take credit for. The, my guide, um, Thomas Vicker, who is a, a, sort of a well-known photographer from the Faroe Islands, you know, these are his images, but I just like them so much, I put them, you know, in this slideshow. Uh, <clears throat> you know, because he does all the tours on the Faroe Islands. He's like the main person to do tours there. And I've been, our company's worked with him a number of times. This is called the Lake Above the Ocean, and it really is a lake above the ocean. You know, it's just, just phenomenal. I mean, the, just the, the geological stuff there is amazing. And then the, the houses with these grass roofs. Even a hotel has a grass roof. And um, I've seen, uh, on our hotel has more of a flatter roof. I don't know how they trim such a steep roof. On the flatter roofs with a slight incline, they put goats or sheep up there. And, you know, and they, they graze on, on, the, on the grass. It's just amazing, the architecture. So this is one of mine, of, of these wonderful tide pools. And, a, and, a, and, a, and lots of waterfalls. The waterfalls a lot depend on how much rain they have. You know, um, this waterfall, though, is pretty constant. This is a very famous waterfall in the Faroe Islands. This one um, comes and goes depending on the rain. So here you see this, these, these wonderful falls, that are very, very large, but occasionally you get very heavy showers and then it clears up and it's beautiful again. <clears throat> this is called the witch's finger. And apparently there was this, this ancient witch and someone cast a spell on her and as she was sinking into the ocean, she pointed her finger up and then she turned to stone. So the witch's finger. Okay, funny story. I had to put this in here because in the Faroe Islands, if you get French fries, it doesn't come with ketchup. It comes with mayonnaise. I'm sitting down with a, a few people. Um, it was sort of a rainy day, and all of a sudden the rain stopped, and the sun came out, and a beam of light came through the window and hit my little plate of mayonnaise. So I decided to call it light on the mayo. <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for laughing a little bit. <laughs> Uh, okay, then there's me in the Faroe Islands. Someone took that shot against, and this was a fascinating area because it was clouds above and clouds below. You know, it was really pretty, pretty amazing to see it. Okay, we're almost done. We're gonna do a quick trip to the to Santorini. H how many of you have been to Santorini? Okay, wow, more than half. So we stay there in Fira Stefani. Um, there's a capital, and just right near. Fira Stefani, right here. So we're actually about a 10 minute walk from Fira. It's not, Fira is very touristy, but the architecture is amazing. I mean, th those of you will recognize a lot of the places. Now this is from our hotel, looking north to Ia. You know, Ia is, is also very touristy, but very beautiful town. You know, and we try to get there before it gets too touristy in the mornings. You know, with that wonderful windmill up on the, on the ridge there. So he's closer to the windmill, nice bright whites, you know, and there's just, you know, there are churches, uh, you all know this, there are churches in, in uh, 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 you know, on those islands like there are pubs in Ireland, you know, like every corner there's a church, you know, every single corner, and with those blue domes, you know, they really make for just wonderful photographic opportunities. And then some of the shop fronts. I couldn't resist this. You know, it, it almost looked like a natural frame, the way these hats were displayed in the shop front. And then uh, this is from a hotel window. Um, oh, sorry, my hotel balcony um, looking out over the Aegean Sea for a sunset. 
we say this wonderful hotel, Hotel Ira is called. It, and it looks like Ira, but it's pronounced Ira. And uh, that was the son of Zeus, I found out, whose name is Ira. And we're going to end with some wall graffiti that I saw in Marrakesh. Be the reason someone smiles today. I thought that was pretty nice in Morocco. It's in Arabic and in English. I thought that was a really nice bit of graffiti. So that is the end of the show. And I'm, I'm, oh, let me do a little commercial. I'm a terrible uh, salesperson or business person, but if any of you were interested in any of the photo tours that I do, the website is photo, P-H-O-T-O, T-C dot com. Photo TC. TC stands for photo tour collection. Photo TC dot com. I've gotten, I've had bird watchers, I've, I've had artists, I've had poets, I've had people who just like not to be rushed. It's not the type of tour that stops at every gift shop on, and, you know, en route. Um, it's a very easygoing tour. Um, and as, as you saw the groups, some are five people, some are six people. You know, everyone, the serious photographers are very happy to be taken to wonderful places to photograph. Don't have to worry where you're going to stay or where you're going to eat or make any decisions. You're met at the airport. Everything is taken care of. And I, if you shop around for this kind of tour, you see that our company is far less expensive than like Van Oss or any of the other big photo tour companies because basically it's run by one person. Not me. I work for her. Her name is Jackie Steedle. She lives uh, uh, near Ithaca, New York, and she's been doing this for about 25 years. Both Jackie and I worked for a company called Voyagers International for maybe 20 years before that. And before that, I was just independent doing the Irish photo workshops. But um, the company called Voyagers International was bought out by a bunch of venture capitalists that knew nothing about running photo tours. They thought photo tours, birding tours, how different can they be? So they put Voyagers together with a company that did birding tours. Big difference, big mistake. Photographers don't want to go with a bunch of birders who see a bird and move on. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not what photographers really want to see. They, they, want, they want time to photograph. They want to be taken to beautiful places, not just where birds nest. So, no one, so the company Voyagers evaporated, but Jackie, who worked for Voyagers, you know, loved her job so much, she started her own company, and I've been working with her ever since. Cool. So that's, that's my story. Yes? A um, couple questions. Uh, how do you deal with tripods? Do you recommend uh, traveling with uh, Well, let me tell you, I, uh, it's a very personal decision. Now, before digital photography, I definitely recommend it if you're at all serious about photography to take a tripod. You know, because you couldn't change your, your, your ISO. You know, like if you would shoot even Tri-X, you know, if you were at 400, you couldn't, if you pushed it to 800, you got grain. You know, I mean, now we could shoot at 1,200 and, and even higher. Sometimes in, in some of the churches uh, or mosques, I shoot like uh, 1,200, no problem at all, you know, with, with digital photography now. Even the, the phones are so darn good now. You could work in low lighting conditions. So it isn't necessary. It's a personal decision. Um, I like to work on a tripod when I'm doing more landscape work. So, so if I'm walking through the streets of, of Fez doing street photography, I don't take a tripod. If I'm in the Sahara Desert you know, in, uh, before sunrise and I'm walking around the dunes, I'll take a tripod. I like to set up, take my time, look through the camera to compose the image. Not, but half the group doesn't have a tripod because they're not used to it. If you're used to it, you could do it. It's not a requirement anymore. It's just a personal preference, literally a personal preference. So I shoot, aside from color, I do black and white and I do infrared black and white. And a lot of the work I've exhibited, I, I have five books that I've, I've published. If you go to my website, which is just my name, ronrosenstock.com, you know, you, you can see what I've published and you can see my different portfolios and you'll see a lot of infrared work. Uh, I, I, yes. <clears throat> I do a whole program on infrared, so it's kind of, kind of hard. It's this, the color um, underneath red is infrared. In other words, there's the visible spectrum, 
what we see. You know, like the colors of the rainbow, red, orange, green, blue, violet, you know, yellow, all that business. However, the measurable spectrum of light, and I got this from a Nova show on PBS. They were talking about light. If you drew a line from Boston to San Francisco, okay, and if you placed a dime on that line, that's the visible spectrum, what we see. The measurable spectrum is that line. We see a very small portion of the entire range of light called the measurable spectrum of light. Infrared is, it's, it's, you know, all light is radiation you know, coming from the sun. Infrared is that, that spectrum of light under red. You know, there's, 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 there's uh, ultraviolet light, um, uh, there's, there's like all kinds of lights. It gets very, very technical, you know, in terms that I don't even understand, but I do know infrared sees differently. It just, it's, uh, it, so you know. If you take a picture of that with infrared, would it? The reds would come out, reds come out very, very light, blues come out very, very dark. And, okay. you know. It's a totally different way of seeing. Totally, totally different. Maybe I'll talk to Kevin and I'll do a whole program on infrared. I have a whole PowerPoint program just talking about um, infrared. So it's, it's a, it, it interprets the light in a different way. Bumblebees only see infrared because the flowers um, give off more infrared radiation you know, than the surrounding area. So they could be zooming along and see a flower and say, aha, zoom. It glows for them. We don't see it that way. Insects see different spectrum of light. And little, li some little lizards could see 10 times more than we could see. You know, we're, we're actually not the center of the universe. And, and you know, uh, we all have our own kind of reality, basically. You know, and, and the colors that we see is limited to what our brain can process and, and what the, our eye structure is capable of, of taking in. But infrared is, is something we cannot see. It's just like, let's say um, you, you're, you're losing heat in your house. There are companies that will set up infrared cameras in, at night when it's totally dark at your camera because heat gives off infrared light. It looked like the aurora borealis. It looked like a cloud of green clouds coming out of the corner of your house where the heat is leaking. You know, if you had a home inspection and they wanted to, to check if there's any heat loss, that's, they do it with infrared cameras. <clears throat> but I, I'd have to do a whole program uh, with explanations and, and show you the choices of, of why infrared is so different. So I, as I said, I shoot infrared black and white and color, and I enjoy it all. So folks, thank you so much for coming this afternoon. I really, really appreciate it.